Good morning, everyone. We're continuing with our salient characteristics of the Master from Swami Kriyananda's biography of Yogananda. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Bless us that we feel your presence. Awaken us from the confusion of maya, that we may see the clear light of your guiding wisdom. We are your children. Bless us and guide us and bring us home to thee. Om. Peace. Amen. (coughs) I had to shorten the prayer because the sneeze was chasing me. (laughs) Forgive me. That was a fairly mild sneeze, I think. I hope the microphone didn't amplify it too much. I have a very powerful sneeze, which I inherited from my mother. My, My mother could be heard by the neighbors when she would sneeze. And in this community that I live in, especially in the summer when I keep my door, my sliding door open, um, I have actually sneezed and have had my neighbors, you know, eight units down, email me Gesundheit like that. (laughs) So I seem to have become my mother's child. My favorite, though, was when we were having a long meditation. This was before we had our temple. We were in the, the storefront church that we had for about six or seven years there. And I had my microphone because I was leading it. And usually the sound person mutes the microphone for the course of the meditation. Right in the middle of a very deep meditation, this incredible sneeze, amplified by my microphone, just burst into this silent room of meditators. I think um, several people's nervous systems may have been damaged for a period of time. So I get real scared when the mic when the sneeze is coming on the mic. At least, however, <clears throat> you weren't silent when it was going on. So here we are. We are in Master's twenty first characteristic, according to Swami's list here. Swami says, Master had keen insight into human nature. For even though a master no longer himself has any delusions, to the point even of wondering how anyone could be so blinded by them. He well remembers all the incarnations he himself suffered as he went through, as he went through those same delusions himself. (coughs) This is the theme you've heard me talk about. Now I get to talk right on it. Yogananda offered the above explanation indeed for the reason why Jesus would have had first to transcend delusion in a former life to be able to help others in this one. I mean, that's a, these are very important point here. No human being, even a master, is ever directly a son of God. I have read that claim on the part of disciples of other paths besides the Christian. Yogananda's answer to that was, what would be the point? It is the destiny of every soul to merge back into oneness with God. But if a miraculously produced direct incarnation of God were to descend on earth, what encouragement would that give to human beings to go thou and do likewise? Now the point that Swami is making here, first of all, it's a huge philosophical discussion in uh, especially in Christianity and to a very large extent in Judaism also because Judaism and Christianity are actually the same line. Um, Jesus was an avatar to the Jewish people. He came not to contradict the scripture but to fulfill it. But that's a whole different discussion. But it does interlace. Here's here's what's happening. This, This takes place in the spiritual life 
in in the spiritual legacy of all great masters. So let me sort of give a context here. Sanatan Dharma is the phrase that is used in India, and that phrase means either the eternal religion, or another way of saying that is that which is. The eternal religion is that which is, meaning that it's not a man-made construction. It's not, quote, if God didn't exist, man would have to invent him. It's none of that. It's the way things are, the way we're made. Um, A great deal of what we call science is just careful, systematic observance of the way things are. And even when we say that someone invents something, they put together uh, forces or materials or, 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 divi- or principles, they put them together to create some practical result that no one may have put together in just that same way before. But they didn't invent in the sense of they can't create divine law. They can't create um, natural substances that weren't already there. They can combine them and do alchemy and make something else from it. And they invent whatever process and product they may have created. But it was there to be discovered because (coughs) it was inherently a part of creation and just hadn't been noticed. Part of this is the yugas as the plant, as the planet evolves that which was hidden from man's consciousness, the consciousness has become such that suddenly we understand it. Swami Kriyananda's father was a pioneer in his particular field, which was, um, he was an oil geologist. He worked for what was called Standard Oil at that time, which is now, I believe, called ESSO. And he was posted to Romania, which is where Swami G was born. And, um, he he developed an oil refinery and many uses for oil and so on. And I mean, all of this has gotten bad publicity now because of it's been taken in ways that haven't been helpful. But this revolution of, of a new kind of energy, other than just the physical body of man and animals, is part of a rising yuga, that we get more refined in the way we can do things. I mean, my very conversation with you at this moment is because many brilliant um, thinkers discovered and invented ways for us to communicate across time and space, which is what we're doing. And yes, as the yugas grow, some inventions are put to negative use and some are put to positive use. There is negative consequences, but that doesn't mean the fundamental direction is not upward and God-inspired. In, in Romania, oil had been just bubbling out of the ground as long as anybody knew. But nobody knew until you know the 1900s what could be done with that. So he came in and helped the whole country and the whole world figure out what could be done with that which had been bubbling out of the earth the whole time. So Sanatan Dharma, from the, so let me go through with this. So it's, 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 you speak of the oil there, and the oil is just that which is. And it has certain properties, which with the right <clears throat> understanding can be put to certain uses because it, it's that which is. It was just waiting to be understood. It wasn't invented by the person who understood it. It was just waiting to be understood. So when when... The Indian philosophy, which India has always been the guru of the planet, it is the only continuous civilization on earth, continuous in the sense that the culture has always been the same. They go back thousands and thousands of years and find evidence of the same yogic practices, the the, the spiritual understanding has always been the same. The country has risen and fallen, but but the cultural, spiritual understanding has always been the same. They can verify it thousands and thousands of years ago. Nobody knows how far back. And that's where the phrase Sanat and Dharma comes from, the eternal religion, um, that which is. And people people have revelations. 
They have a revelation of that which is. They express their revelation in the way that is appropriate for the culture, for the the yuga cycle, for the disciples that they've come to help. And that um, self-realized master comes and speaks about that which is, which is the inevitable destiny of it. Excuse me, <coughs> of every human being and how to achieve it. Now, every true religion, every Sanatan Dharma religion, starts with direct revelation of that which is by an individual, even if that individual's name, like Hinduism, does not have a specific founder, it's unique because the culture has been going on so. Out so long, but there are countless lineages of the Hindu faith of Sanat and Dharma. Hindu is actually not an indigenous word. Hindu was imposed by the English because there was a river called the Indus River, and these people lived by the Indus River. They had practices and understandings that were different from the British, so they they called what they were doing Hinduism. But the, but the people in India had never called it Hinduism. They had called it Sanatan Dharma. So each one of these masters who comes, and, and the West and the East differ in this, the Bhagavad Gita says, whenever virtue declines and vice predominates, I, the infinite spirit, take visible human form in order to, to drive back the darkness and bring in light, to... to uh, to destroy evil and uh, raise dharma again. Dharma means right action which leads to expanded consciousness. So when dharma declines, right actions that lead to expanded consciousness have declined. If you look at the USA today, you would say that dharma is declining because right action that leads to expanded consciousness is not commonly practiced in the popular, mainstream, visible culture. Simultaneously, avatars have come, including Yogananda, most recently to the U.S., and Dharma is also rising, like a wonderful, inevitable tide is also rising, because Adharma, the opposite of Dharma, has also been gaining a foothold, so Dharma now has to rise. Now, when these great masters come, whether it's Buddha or Krishna or Moses, um, whoever that great master might be, it's his followers, and it, it, all avatars in history, mostly, I mean, I'm going to say this, the avatar is almost always male, and I don't know of any example when an avatar was female. An avatar is a fully self-realized being who has no karma of his own, who has completely transcended all delusion. That's what Swami says about Master. And then takes visible form, as the Gita says. The question has obviously been asked, why are there no women avatars? Swami's answer, and he, he didn't answer it like, this is the explanation, but you, you, you work backwards from empirical facts. He said, um, an avatar could choose his body at that point. So if there were a benefit, there, there's, no, uh, there's no reason why an avatar couldn't be in a female body if that was the avatar's inclination. But Swamiji said, masculine and feminine energy, yin and yang energy, are part of Sanatana Dharma. It's, it's inherent. Yin and yang, two completely equal opposites that make a full circle. And... Um, so there's nothing inherent about male or female, meaning inherently better. They're just two aspects. One of the aspects of self-realization is that both yin and yang are completely present in their perfected form within the, the being. Master was often mistaken for a woman. It was He had long hair at a time when men did not have long hair, and he often wore it loose and showing. Um, but the reason he was mistaken for a woman many times is because the feminine principle was so equally strong in him that no matter what his the, the physiology of his body, he could manifest a, a perfect feminine consciousness 
as easily as he could manifest a yang consciousness. Yin and yang were completely available to him. So it, it, you get into other kinds of subtleties. Um, so, of course, why wouldn't he just be in a female body and be yin and yang? Swami's answer was, the nature of an avatar is that it's a yang thing to do because you come out and you put forward this huge project, this mission to change the world. This is not a project that belongs to men or women. That's a project that has the characteristics of yang. So the male body is the yang form. So perhaps that's the question. Even when, I mean, when great saints like Ananda Moima most recently, but uh, but who was not an avatar, but she was a jivan mukta, certainly, meaning she was fully freed. This gets into nuances that are beyond the time frame I have. But even her work, she did a very yin mis- mission. A, a great deal happened around her, but she just sat there. <laughs> she didn't manage any of it. She called it your ashram, your magazine, your project. She was very, very yin in the way she served. She sat, she radiated. She was called mother. That was her reality. So who can say? But what happens is, these great masters, and we will say he, because that's what we're always talking about. He is so extraordinary. And the disciples experience this complete revolution that's possible by attunement. And then the human mind tries to explain somehow how to explain the extraordinary greatness that we've experienced. And so what happens is um, the actual reality of the incarnated master, and because we're close to the life of Yogananda, and even though no one that I know now actually met Yogananda, well, it's not entirely true, but Swami Kriyananda, who knew him deeply and well, um, is now passed from the earth, but we're still only one generation away. So the facts, the objective facts of Yogananda's life are still more clear to us. But the tendency is that in order to communicate what we feel about this master, we tend to start creating legend around. Or we start telling stories that are actually, as one author said, often the legend is more true than the facts. Because the legend carries the incomprehensible to the human ego power of the master we're trying to describe. But then what happens is what starts out as profound devotion tends to become dogma and theology after a while. And also as time passes and people think they're being very clever by explaining things. But if they themselves do not share the revelation or have a deep enough understanding, they start taking the revelation of the master and they think they're improving it by explaining it. In um, his book, um, this book which is called The Revelations of Christ, now that I'm trying I have to get it out of the shelf. This book, The Revelations of Christ, which Swamiji wrote. This is not like his commentary on the Gita where he goes verse by verse and describes it, nor is it like the SRF version of Master's Commentary on the New Testament. This is Swamiji explaining, and and he has a very simple thesis, which he explains it really well. No one is qualified to explain a Master except someone who shares his consciousness. In other words, the saints speak for the Masters, not the theologians, not the academicians, God forbid, not the novelists, you know, it's, it's not the uh, institution, but those who have the capacity to perceive the consciousness. So Jesus spoke continuously, to come directly to where we were, are right now, about the fact that he was the Son of God. Now, what he meant, and that God was his Father, and he, had, he said lots of other things. But he was the Son of God. Now, when you go to the Indian teaching, when you go to the Bhagavad Gita and other of those ancient scriptures, son of God means the offspring of, created by. And um, the Christ, and the only son of God means the only true offspring of the divine 
is the realization of our own divinity. And Christ was the anointed one because he had had the realization of his divinity, of his oneness with the Father. I and my Father are one, he said repeatedly. And the human mind, without the revelation, just simply doesn't know what to do with that. And we have this desire, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not going to interpret the whole New Testament right now. But all of those sound singular. Um, The entire misunderstanding in this respect between Christianity and Sanat and Dharma is the pronoun I. When a normal person uses the pronoun I, they mean my body, my ego, and all the limiting conditions in relationship to it. So Jesus often said, I, but when uh, a master uses the pronoun I, he means I, the Christ consciousness, which is one with the infinite. It does not mean any of those limiting conditions. So Jesus made a distinction sometimes. He was the son of man, which was Jesus, because there he was, or he was the son of God, which meant the Christ consciousness. He lived both realities. And if you, if you can figure out which I he was using, then everything he says makes perfect sense. Now, it's vitally important that we understand this, and this is what Swami's talking about today, because what a, 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 an avatar, as we understand from Sanat and Dharma, presents to us is he presents our destiny. And he doesn't present our destiny because I, I am going to sacrifice my life and do it all for you. He presents our, de- our destiny because, as we've titled this segment, because he's been there and he's done that. And, and it is not a diminution of our devotion to Christ to follow his advice. Be therefore perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. That which I do, ye shall do, and greater things. These were not compliments. These were just flat statements of fact. And because he stands there as the fulfillment of our own destiny. And this is how, well, I mean, it, um, it, it's like if you see somebody who plays the piano really beautifully or cooks really beautifully or can sing or can run really fast, and they say, look, I did this by a certain kind of training, by certain kind of actions, by perseverance, by willpower, and by putting in the time in the right way. And all tell you how I got to be what I am. And if you do it, you can become me as well. That which I do, you shall do in greater things. It, we don't think that odd when we're learning to play the piano or to be a, an athlete. We find someone who has accomplished what we're trying to accomplish and then, and then the power of that relationship is because they're going to bring us to that level. Not they're going to say, well, you'll get to the gates of the palace, but then you just, you're going to be locked out. No, I'm going to unlock it and show you how to come all the way in. And what that does also is you see that gives us something to do. And yes, of course, it requires faith and it requires devotion and surrender and receptivity and grace, above all grace, because it's the power of the master comes into us because the ego itself doesn't have the power to dissolve itself, but the master gives us that power just the way a great teacher, a great coach, what they give us, and this is how on a much smaller level, but we still experience it, what they give us is more than just ideas and techniques. What they transfer to us is also this power to be able to do it which is why, unfortunately, the word guru has come down into common parlance in a way that's almost blasphemous. But, you, but somebody who really teaches you to do something, we call them a guru. You know, you're an investment guru or a, a cooking guru, which is an unfortunate use of the word because the word then loses its divine magnetism. But you understand why people say it, because it says something that mere teacher may not say, you know, or coach may not say. But if we take Jesus and and Krishna 
and Buddha and all of these, these great avatars and put them in a category that we can never be any part of it, where does that leave us? And, and what do we do with ourselves? What becomes, what is the real, even what is the real purpose of the religion? So the religion itself becomes a little confused. That's really the only word. Um, it, earlier sessions of these, when I was still working on the Money Magnetism book, and claimed to, came to the section on crystal clarity, which is what Swami calls a publishing company. I spent several weeks talking about what is crystal clarity. And right after that description in that book, it says, muddy thoughts and feelings lead to chaos. And what is ha- what happens? Not what has happened, but what does happen. The avatar comes, he brings a pure revelation, he communicates it to his disciples. For a while, that pure revelation remains. And then gradually, over time, it sinks into dogma and institution because muddy thoughts and feelings get involved. What did Jesus really mean by be therefore perfect? Some translations just say, you know, be therefore a good person because they don't know what the word perfect means anymore. That's why the avatars keep coming back. Again, this is all very clear in the Gita because we begin to lose the thread. I, I, I had a Jewish rabbi come to me one, once and because I'm a yogi and I came from a Jewish family, I was the one he could talk to. And he said himself, and in fact he had to leave being a rabbi, he was losing what the point of Judaism was. And I talked to him about it. Judaism is Sanatana Dharma. It's a true religion. There are, there are threads of, of Judaism that are pure Sanatana Dharma. Um, but he had gotten himself caught in one that, where the thinking was a little muddy because they had lost the idea that the purpose of human life is to come become perfect as the masters are perfect. And Christianity traditionally, not Christianity itself, well, churchianity is what Master called it, has also lost that because in our great desire to show how wonderful Christ is, we have made him entirely different from ourselves. And as Master says, as Swami says in this book here, what good does that do us? I mean, that's not me, so here I am. You know, and by the grace of God, I get to go to heaven for a long time. But there's a lot of muddy thinking in here. Whereas when, and this is why Yogananda incarnated. He incarnated with a mission from God to show that the original teachings of Krishna, which have become equally confused in what is called Hinduism, in India does better than most, and it, and it still has the idea of God realization, but Hinduism has also become layered over with many levels of misunderstanding. And Christianity, he came to show that, that what Krishna taught and what Christ taught were the same teachings. And, Jesus, and Yogananda came to restore original teachings of Jesus, original teachings of Krishna, to bring East and West together, to, re, to, to drive back Adharma, and to bring forward Dharma. Dharma, those actions which will lead to God-realization. And so Master's understanding of our life experience was very simple. Been there, done that, know exactly where you're standing, was there myself, trapped in that delusion, and here, let me tell you how to get yourself out of it. And there's, there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for, I know what you're feeling. I've been through it myself. It gives compassion, it gives sympathy, it gives profound wisdom, and it gives the magnetism to take us forward. And knowing that that which Christ himself did, I will do, and have that be the word of the Master to me in its true, complete, you know, unadulterated meaning, that's the power. That's the power of self-realization that draws us to the path, holds us to the path, and ultimately liberates us in the light. God bless you.